Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about Vimgo and like uh, about the features, like uh, how to use Vimgo, and about the, like there is a lot of features, but nobody knows them. So, uh, but first, before I start, I'll just like let me talk about me a little bit. Like I'm a software engineer, as Mitch said. I'm working for the delivery team, and like we're building like an abstraction on top of Kubernetes, and we're trying to make the internal engineers much more happy, and trying to improve their uh, productivity. And then, of course, like uh, I wrote Vimgo like two and a half years ago. I've started to make it more better. I have a lot of like Go packages open source, and I still have many like under GitHub Fati, but I don't remember the names anymore. There's tons of there. And then, uh, I also try to contribute to a lot of Go open source projects, like to Go itself, uh, the HCL, Terraform, and Kite, stuff like that. So yeah, that's me. And so what is Vimgo? Uh, yeah, so it's a plugin, of course, but it's the, the aim is to provide a full-featured development environment to make developing Go productive and efficient. So that's Vimgo. And so it tries to, be, uh, to make you more efficient and productive. And today I'm going to like uh, talk about these topics like, like we're going to start with how do we run a Go package, a Go file, and then we're going to talk about all these topics and how to use Vimgo uh, for each of these. And I've already wrote all uh, my talk here at uh, this uh, GitHub repository. Uh, it's a really nice uh, tutorial like I've started it f one month ago. And the talk content is actually the same here. So if you can't follow or if you, I mean, don't understand anything, you can just follow it from beginning and then try yourself at home from the beginning. All of the uh, features are here written. And I also like explain how to install uh, Vimgo and stuff like that. So yeah, this is the, this is the tutorial uh, reminder. And yeah, let's start. So. This is, yeah, so this is our, I have like 15, 16 files, examples, and then I'm just gonna go over them and explain the, like how do we use Vimgo, right? So we have this command called go run. Uh, if you run it, oh wait, okay, of course this is Murphy's Law, it goes, everything goes wrong for the first time. Yeah, so if you run it, it goes and compiles and then outputs the, uh, output to standard output. and the next is we have Go build, uh, which compiles your package and then uh, gives something like uh, a notification saying the build is success. The difference between normal Go build, if you like call Go build from command line and from Vim, is that this doesn't create any binary. And then, like, if there is any error, it is uh, it's parsing them and it's showing them in a quick fix window, and it lets you like jump between them, which is uh, I'm going to show it. And then like it also automatically detects your Go path. So like if you use GB or like Go Depths, any other dependency tools, it goes and detects them. And it also works as synchronized. Like if you use NeoVim or like with Vim uh, 8.0, it will be all like, it will not block Vim itself. So yeah, um, so let's, let me show like what happens when you build and there is errors. Like here we have like two errors. And when I build it, you'll see that uh, Vimgo parses it and puts it in the new window. Like, and then you can jump between them uh, with the C next, like C next, and with the C previous. These are uh, commands and shortcuts that you can use and like to jump between errors. And the great thing is like, suppose you delete, a f like fix the bug, and then you save it, right? And then you build it, it again. Uh, as you see the quick fix dynamically, I mean, uh, changes while you're changing your fixes. So again, let's remove this and build again, and build success. So this is like when you have a package and you have a lot of uh, problems, you just uh, go and like uh, um, call go build and then collect all the errors and then fix them one by one. And the great thing is like you can also bind these C next and C previous to a shortcut and it's like it makes it really easy to jump between that. So yeah, uh, what about test? Um, I have a test file here, the test bar file. And like, again, we have a go test command. And if you run it, it just runs go test. And 
shows like uh, it passes it. And it's just like GoBuild, it has the ability to pass errors. Like, uh, like suppose I have here two other uh, functions with intentional errors. And when I go and go test it, as you see, you can jump between errors here and then uh, like go and fix them. So let's close this window here. So the problem here is that like suppose you have a test file with thousands of lines and you have many, many tests in it. And when you say go pass, like go test, it goes and tries to test it and it fails. But sometimes you're only like uh, just developing one single function, right? So you are gonna, you just want to test test bar. So of course you can do it from command line, but you are inside the editor. And for that case, we have a command called go test func. When you call it, it just uh, tests the function inside the cursor. So if your cursor is inside that function, it only tests that file. This is really great, like if you have a lot of tests, you can just uh, call go test func and then uh, see if it really runs or not. And the second uh, feature is, like sometimes you're creating the test code and in that case you don't wanna test it. You want just compile it, like it should be really compiled without any problems. And like for that we have another command uh, called go test compile and this is just the same like go build and if you just call it, it goes and compiles the test file, but it doesn't run it. This is, so this is great, like suppose you have an integration test and you just want to be sure that it really compiles and uh, runs without any problem. So yeah, let's move to another topic, uh, test coverage. Um, so yeah, in Go we have, uh, we have the ability of seeing like how many functions are covered by tests or not. And previously we were uh, calling, we had this go covers functions, we, we still have it. And if you call it, like it goes and uh, parses the coverage file, the cover profile file, and then highlights it uh, internally inside of them. And you can like uh, go and clear it, like and go back again. Uh, but like for example, what happens like if you have a test file, uh, like here, and then like, suppose here's a test rule, right? So now we are gonna see what uh, Go coverage says. Yes, as you see, like foo is covered as well. And then I have a test that goes and covers, uh, oh wait, I've removed it. Uh, so this is testing the uh, queues function, like when I like, clear and then call again. As you see now, this is also covered. So because uh, like running coverage and then clear, clearing is so used to a lot, we have a command called go coverage toggle. And this is like, it just acts like a toggle. Whenever you call it, it goes and calls it. If you call it again, it clears it. So if you bind it to a shortcut, you can just call it and then it cleans or it just calls go coverage. And it's really nice, I mean, I like it. So yeah, this is like how we uh, use like the basic uh, Go uh, commands, like uh, building, testing, and coverage. But what about editing? Like Vim is really powerful about editing. And yeah, let me show some of the example about editing. Uh, yeah, this is not nice. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, we have here two functions. One is here and the other one is here. It's just a dumb function, it doesn't do anything. And like, as you know, Vim has this text objects and you can like move between words. Like you have the W, like when you click on it, you can jump between like uh, words or like characters and then you can jump back with the B character. Like this is great. Like you can combine an operator, like delete a word and then it goes and delete. But what about go uh, source code itself? Like what if you could go and like select the function itself, like inside the function? So for that we have a, text object called uh, if, it's called inner function. And like when you combine it like with uh, visual e, uh, vif, it means visually select inside function. So I'm just typing it, normal command, as you see it goes and selects the inner function. Uh, like you can also combine something else like delete inside function. 
like go, it goes and deletes. And it's really nice and sometimes you would just want to clean it up or like you, you want to copy it, yank uh, if and then like we have copied it and then like you can copy, uh, paste it somewhere else. And again here, like uh, selecting a function, again, like but what about like this uh, anonymous function? Like if your cursor is beginning from the func here or like uh, here and then when you call uh, y, uh, say VIF, it goes and selects the anonymous function. And then like you can also delete inside it. So it's really great and under the hood, it uses the tool called motion. Uh, I wrote it like I think six months ago, I don't remember anymore. Uh, and it does like parses the source code and then it just uh, walks over the AST and then prints, uh, returns a JSON with all the functions like positions where it starts and ends. And then on the Vim side, I'm just trying to make it with the uh, text object compatible. And you know what's great is like uh, the AST also has this uh, comments, like, like the comment here is a part of the function declaration. This is really great. Like if your cursor is inside the comment, like you can still select the function. So because you know, uh, it can understand it, right? Or you can, uh, use the AF uh, text object, which is called all function or a function. I mean, doesn't matter. So when you call it, it also selects all of them, like with the command itself. This is really nice. So you can just copy it with the command and then paste it somewhere else. But some people don't like the command inclusion. So for that, we have a, we have a you know, what they call a setting. So with the setting, you can disable it. This is the setting. Like when you add it to your VimRC and uh, make uh, and it's equal to zero, it will not include the uh, command anymore. So yeah, let's move to another example of what editing. This is a this is a uh, there is a type foo and then uh, definition here. So but of course, like when you review it, someone will come and say, hey, this is not great. So this should be multi-line, and then you go and then like manually uh, change that. But you don't need it. Like there is a again a nor normal uh, mode command called uh, called uh, G and uppercase S. Uh, this means split. Uh, and when you put your cursor like here on top of the foo here, and then type it, it goes and splits it for you automatically. And this is really great. Like and if you want to join it back. You uh, type again uh, G uh, like this. Uh, I, I don't know what to pronounce like this one, and then you, your cursor is on top of the foo type here, and then uh, you type it, and then you can join it as well. Uh, but this is not a Vimgo feature. This is a plugin feature, and it's called Split Join. This is again in the tutorial. You can go and get it. But I mean, uh, one of the issues is that. Uh, this doesn't work well for uh, like multi uh, struct definitions like struct inside structs. Uh, so like I want to add this feature to motion so it should be again AST compatible. So yeah, let's move to a really great feature, uh, snippets, which I think is really great here. So, uh, mm -hmm. so you know snippets is really great for creating a code that is repetitive. Like in our case, uh, if error is not nil, do something, right? So Vim uh, Go has a lot of snippets to fix this. Like there is this snippet called uh, error P. You just type it and then you hit tab. It goes and uh, creates a snippet like this. This is a panic. Uh, if error nil is a panic, like just, just an error. Again, let's do this the same here. And this is so easy, like, and you can also have like something else, like this, or like when you add a comma, you can change it to so something else, like this. And this is really nice, like when you once you get to used to it, it makes it really easy to write code in a very fast uh, mode. So yeah, let's print this uh, out uh, variable here, and then like you know we have another sn uh, snippet for it. It's called the fn snippet, like when you write fn and hit tab, it goes and just opens fm uh, format printer line. But that's not enough, like we can be better here. 
there is another, it's called FF. And when you call it, like it puts a cursor, but you can still write. So we're gonna just write this string out, okay? So this goes and completes it uh, even for the parameter itself and the format string itself. Then this is really nice and like it's really useful uh, because like uh, usually when you do debugging with uh, print uh, statements, it's really nice. And then like let's run this and see what's happened. Okay, it runs, but there is a thing, problem. So like the, uh, this, these are all uppercase, right? And be, to make them lowercase, we have to go and add the JSON field like here to the end. And this is, I think, something that I don't like too much, but uh, we have to. And then like we have to remember like how what is like JSON, and then you type something like this, right? And then you, when you run it again, so now this is lowercase. Okay, great. So how can we make it better? Uh, so Vim Go has this snippet called JSON. And when you write it and hit tab, it automatically goes and completes it. But what about something like a variable like server name? Again, this is really great. Look what happens. So it automatically uh, changes it to snake case, which is really great. Uh, but we have something more, like I've just implemented it today, and I think it's better. Like we have this string struct here and like it's really annoying like writing all these uh, snippets, right? But we can be better, right? What if we could select all of them and then just say, hey, add the text for me, so, so that's it, you know? So now we have all the JSON text here. It's all snake case, all for you. And the great thing is like, if you don't like JSON, like your Tomo guy, again, uh, select it, go add text, but you can say, hey, use XML. I don't know who uses it, but suppose someone <laughs> used it. And there you go, then you have your XML. So it's all, I just implemented it today, but I think it's great, like, uh, implementing text like that. And the great thing is, like, uh, if you don't like snake case, you can change it to camel case. Like, we have a setting called, uh, like, uh, what is it, snippet, case, type, and then you go and change it to camel, case, and then like, let's see what happens, like, let's put, uh, pick them up, and as you say, uh, as you see, it's now camel case, it's not snake case. So, like, you can use whatever you want. So yeah, this is like how you do you use snippets and you can also add your own snippet. If you have any great ideas, just open an issue and I look at it or someone else. So yeah, let's jump to something else. This is a, a build constraint also called build tag. And sometimes writing this, uh, like you, you have to go and read the document, right? Like because like this is wrong. And why is it wrong? I don't know. But we're gonna figure it out. Like here, we need to uh, put a plus here. Like otherwise, it doesn't work. But again, this is not enough. We have to put a new line. Oh, okay, now it works. Okay, it's green. It means okay, you have successfully uh, write, uh, write it correctly. But this is wrong, right? The macros is like this should be Darwin, right? This is now correct. As you see, like correct uh, uh, tags are highlighted in blue, like Linux, like race, ignore. And it's just for you. Like you can use this, and this is uh, enabled by default. It's something that uh, uh, a lot of people uses. And like for syntax highlighting, we have many other features, like operators, uh, showing methods uh, and functions, and many many other. But we have disabled them. The reason is that uh, it uh, it's very costly. It's not effective on uh, some uh, machines. So that's why you have to go and en enable them from the settings. Um, but I mean, it's great, like, you should use them. So this is a file that compiles perfectly. Okay, this compiles perfectly. But like, it has a lot of errors here. I don't know if you can uh, catch them. Like, but of course we have like uh, checking and vetting uh, uh, tools like GoVet, GoLint, AirCheck, and many others that uh, I don't remember yet. But like we have a GoVet integration and you can call it. And when you call it, you see that there is indeed a lot of error warnings that, I mean, someone should like fix. Like this build Linux, right? This is wrong. 
and this is correct, of course. Uh, and yeah, and then now like, you can jump to between them again uh, with like with C next, and then jump back with uh, C previous, and like there is also Golint. As you see, this goes and calls Golint. There are three errors here, and like this is also a tool that like some people like it. Okay, and like there is also a tool called error check. Like sometimes you call a function like here, write to, but this returns an error. Actually, you should uh, like check it, right? But some people don't check it. And then uh, error check is a tool that goes and like finds those places, and then you can go and add an error check. So because uh, the Go packages like the parser, the AAC, and the stuff, uh, other packages are really useful and uh, very simple. There is a lot of tools. And like every time like calling them, executing them is really annoying. That's why uh, there is a tool called Go MetaLinter, which goes and calls all the tools for you. And we have an uh, integration for that, uh, the command Go MetaLinter, and if you call it, it goes like it's called Golint, GoVet, AirCheck, and many other tools uh, just for you. And then it puts them all into the same quick list, and then you can jump between them. Uh, and like for this, uh, there is a list here. This is the default list. By default, we have Vet, Golint, AirCheck, but you can go and change it. You can add your own tools here, and then MetaLinter will uh, use that. And another really great feature is that you can enable to run this like, uh, like whenever you hit save. So it's just like Go format, but like it will go and call the uh, checkers and like linters you defined. And because like when you save it, you want only tools that run really fast. So that's why it's a different list. Like you can go and put here tools that you want to be run only on safe, but like put something here that you want to run manually, explicitly. So this is Go Metal Ninja. And yeah, let's go and let me show you about something uh, about how do we do like move to other files about navigation. So the, the great thing about Go is that the test files is inside the Go inside the source code, right? So if we have the main Go file here, the test file is just here. And like sometimes you just want to open it and then you have to like go and like open it like this, right? Split, uh, open a split and then open the test file. But we have a command called go alternate. And when you call it, it calls the alternate file, which is in our case the test file and opens it. And if you call it again, if it's the test file, it goes and opens the main file. And I mean, you don't have to remember, right? If I'm like, if I'm main, I just want to open the test file. I don't like, maybe the file name is really long. I don't want to type it. You shouldn't do that as well. And the great thing is like, you can go and assign that to a shortcut, uh, which you can go and find in tutorial, like uh, with a bigger A or AS. Like when I hit AS, it goes and opens it here. But when I uh, write like A, B, it goes and opens a split, and vertical split. So I think this is also very useful, and I use it a lot, and I really recommend it. I mean, use the shortcuts, especially. Uh, is this is only for, for two files? Yeah, two files. Like, every file should have just, uh, uh, yeah. But inside the package, there might be, of course, a lot of other test files. And yeah, another feature is GoDev. This is very popular, a lot of people know it. I just wanna show some of the like shortcuts that, that my, some people might miss. So if you're like here on the printf uh, function, and if you go uh, call godef, it goes and jumps to the definition of the function. And then you can go and call it somewhere else, like here, and then it's here. And if you want to go back, you can call godef pop, and then go dev pop. It, it, it's a stack, and then like you pop out and then you enter in. It's something like that. And the great thing is like there is a shortcut in Vim uh, called a GD, uh, like this. 
And then like we overwrite it, uh, so when you like just hit GD, it calls GoDev. Like here, I just hit GD, like as you see, it's very fast. And then there is another command called uh, control P, which is uh, used for tag stack, which we also over over, uh, we, uh, overwrite it. And then like you can use it like control T, which will jump back. Again, control T will jump back. So these are the shortcuts. I wrote them in the tutorial, you can use them. And lastly, as I said, this is a stack. Uh, so you can like call the go dev stack. And when you call it, uh, you can see all the places you jumped. Like, and then like, you can see that, okay, I was a main and then I was on the print. And I'm like, when I hit enter, I can like follow where I was. And then you can also go uh, and like, uh, clear the stack whenever you want. So lastly, this uses uh, the tool Guru. Uh, previously, it was using GoDev, but Guru handles uh, more cases better, like that imports or vendorized folder. Uh, but it's slow sometimes. People don't like it. That's why we have also a, a setting to use GoDev, the tool itself, if you want. Uh, I'm still using Guru. I like it. I think it's better. But GoDev, is sometimes faster, so you can change between them. So it's up to you. Uh, yeah, so let me show me a feature that is, I think, uh, based on the tool motion. So this is a feature that is enabled only if you have installed the, uh, this plugin, uh, control P dot vim. You know, most of you already uses this. Uh, but some uh, probably use something else like Unite or ZFI, like you know, uh, FZFI, something like that. So anyway, if you have, uh, if you have installed controlp.vim, you have this feature. And what is this feature? So it's called Go Deck Declarations, but I've shortened it, so it's uh, easier to write. So when you, when you call this, uh, it parses the source code for you. And then it finds all the function and type declarations and put them into a quick fix, uh, not quick fix, into the control P uh, view. And then you can just type, like I type just M and A, and then when I hit enter, I'm on the main here. Yeah. Again, I can call it, and then like I can type foo, and it goes and type, finds bar foo here. And it's really nice between them, uh, like to jump. but. Like this is one single file, right? Sometimes a package, a Go package, it can have multiple files inside a, inside a single package. And like uh, a function might call a function from an, another file. So this is all possible. And then you want to, and you don't remember what is it and you want to jump. So we have again this command called go declarations dear. Okay, naming is hard, I know, but I just found this really easy. Uh, this goes and shows all the declarations inside the directory. So when you call it, as you see, we also see now the test here. Like we have here two files, and then uh, like when you type bar, and then uh, like you can just jump here, right? Or again, like you can uh, like jump to the test file, easy, right? And, uh, okay, so, uh, and it's really fast. And like here, let's jump to the format package. Like when you call it, you see it's like it's really fast. There was a, like a write byte here, or like like something else, like test blank in. You know, I don't know, about, but I mean it's fast. You know, it works and uh, it's really nice. And the thing about this is like, again, some people uh, they don't like like they only want to see functions, like not type declarations. In that in that case, you can go and change that as well. Like the current de uh, default setting is like this. Like if you change it to just including uh, func, it will only uh, parse the function declarations. So it's, uh, it's very, uh, what they say, uh, extensible. So. so yeah, but sometimes you just want to jump like to the next function, right? So you don't want to write the name, maybe it's very long. And for that, we have like uh, another text object, and it's the double bracket, yeah, this one, okay. And another one, which is reverse double bracket. 
So when you call the, like this one, it goes and jumps to the next function. So in the normal mode, I'm just hitting double uh, bracket. I'm on the main function. I hit again. I'm on the bar function. I hit again. I'm on the bar full function. So, and this except also a number. Like when I hit three and double bracket, it jumps to the third function, right? And you can go and like combine it with operator. Like if I hit D for delete and double uh, bracket, like double bracket here, and then like I hit just point, like repeat it, and I repeat it, and then you can go and, oh, okay, there's a bug. It should delete this. Anyway, I mean, you can go and like, uh, as you see, like, uh, like you can combine it with any operator you want. So yeah, uh, this is like how you jump between functions, uh, even if you don't know the name or you know the name. So it's up to you. Or you can also use GoDev. So we have a lot of tools here. And sometimes you just want to know like how the function is, like what is the documentation of the function, like what it does, or like which arguments does the function accepts. And so just a little bit history. Previously for documentation, we were just using GoDoc, this one. And, but this is very poorly. Uh, the, the problem with GoDoc is that it just puts for a command line, like it outputs and you are reading from the command line, but it's not something you can parse and then show it into an editor. And, editor. and then uh, we change it and we now use something like uh, get GoDoc, a tool called, this is the tool, get GoDoc, and it's really nice. It's ASD compatible. So like I'm on the println uh, function and I just call GoDoc and it opens a split and just that part, not all of them, it shows me like uh, what the import, the, the package name, the function signature, and the uh, command, the documentation of that. And when I just hit enter, it goes away. I can also do it for, uh, for any, any uh, like functions, like local function. So this is like the function that I wrote. And again, it just uh, shows the signature and the documentation. And like for, for, a, for an identifier, which doesn't have any comment, uh, it just says undocumented. And the great thing is like, there is a, again, shortcut, the uppercase K. So this is like, uh, it's, if you don't use Vimgo or anything else, this is bound to the double, uh, to the help command inside Vim. So when you hit K, double K, it jumps to the Vim script documentation. But we, uh, again, this is overwritten by Vimgo, and like you just have to uh, type uppercase K, and then it uh, just shows them right here. Just uppercase K, like here. Okay, that's it. So um, this uh, just shows the documentation, but this is, not an, uh, this is not a documentation explorer, yeah? So if you want to explore documentation, there is another plugin uh, called Go Explorer. Uh, this is from Gary Bird, which also wrote the uh, Redis package and many other. Like this project is abandoned, right? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, but it still works, I guess. Yeah, I think it works. Like we have an issue open to integrate this into Vimgo, but yeah, it's a lot of work. And I have sometimes the single person, the only one who works on that, so. But it works, like this is, this opens, uh, a, scra a buffer from scratch, and then like you can jump into the source code from the documentation. It's really great. You have to give it a try, like if you like it. So yeah, and then like sometimes you have this function, like uh, you don't know what the type uh, it, what the type is that it accepts. Like here in the printer line, what type does it accept? Right, we don't know. But like when you type uh, go info, it will show the function signature just for you in the status line. So that's why you can see, oh, okay, this is a variadic argument, so it can accept multiple arguments for you, uh, and it's just an empty interface. And then like, uh, if you call it on something else, like here, it doesn't accept anything. This is really great, like when you're just developing something, and there is a function, it's called, but you don't know what is it, it's accepting, like what are the arguments. And so you can go use go info. And the great thing is, uh, you can like 
uh, automatically enabled it. Like there is a, I think, yeah, this one. This is a setting, and if you set it to one, this like as you see, when I whenever I move my cursor, it automatically prints it like, yeah, like this. Uh, so it's really great. You have to give it a try. So yeah, and so let's talk about refactoring. Um, we have to call uh, this tool called Go Rename. Many of you already know this. Uh, I'm just gonna show it like, it's again just called Go Rename. And then you type the name, uh, the new identifier name, like bar. And if you hit, hit in enter, it goes and then change all the uh, <coughs> names that were server is now bar. And the great thing is like this, uh, this is this search for all the Go path through all of your workspace. So if uh, this identifier is exported and some other package imports it, it also goes and rewrites it. And that's why, but sometimes it might be, uh, it also causes problems because that package might not uh, compile or uh, it has parsing problem. In that case, go rename just fails. I think Alan is working on it. He said he's gonna work on fixing it, but I'm not sure. Uh, but this is great. I mean, you should use it when you want to refactor something. But I mean, there is another uh, better feature, and it's called uh, free work. This is a mode of the tool called Guru, uh, which I'm gonna explain uh, in a bit. So what is free work? So free variables are uh, variables that are reference, uh, but not defined inside the selection. So what does this mean? It's reference, but it's not defined inside the selection. So suppose we have this functionality, we have this logic here, and we want to use reuse it. And like when I go and select it and call uh, go free uh, variables. Oh no. What? Oh man. Okay. We have it. <laughs> so yeah, it will print. Uh, it will output a quick fix with uh, with the free variables, with the free identifiers, and there is only one, and it's the it's the message here, this one. So that means this variable is uh, reference here, but it's not defined here. So this means, look, we can select this uh, and hit tab. There is a snippet called func. And when I hit another tab, it goes and creates a function. Uh, let's call this count lines. And then the argument will be our free variable, which is the message which of type is string, right? And then we're just gonna uh, return the count in this new function. Okay, now let's, let's put it and put it here. Okay, so here. So now what you do is you just say, okay, I've uh, extracted the function and then I'm just gonna use this new thing here. And when you run it, three. So it goes and counts the line, there is uh, three new lines. And this is really great, like sometimes you can just go over the some uh, selection and then you can see like how many free variables that are. It's just not for refactoring, it's also great for understanding the code. Like if there are really a lot of free variables, that means the code uh, is a little bit complex. It has a lot of dependencies to outside functions or outside packages. So you might uh, want to split it up into uh, other functionality. So this is how we refactor. Of course, this is not like, uh, like uh, other IDEs, but at, at least it's a start. So in the future, uh, I'm thinking to make this more automatic. So you just select and it goes and creates the function for you automatically. And I think it's a usable, uh, very usable uh, feature. And yeah, so I've, I've talked about Guru. Uh, Guru is a call uh, tool. Uh, which is uh, used like, uh, which is written by Alan Donovan. He also gave a talk uh, at GopherCon. Uh, what is, okay, this is the thing, yeah. So it's a, it's a tool for navigating and understanding the Go code. And he wrote a really great uh, manual, like 
all about the queries, like what it can do for you, and like with all like also with some uh, like examples like this real time. So uh, go and read this. This link is also in the tutorial. Uh, but this is for Emacs. Uh, but we are all we we have these features also in Vimgo. So you are all uh, covered by that. No worries because. The problem with Guru is that it's not meant to be run from the command line. It should be integrated into an editor. Um, so that's why like, uh, if your editor doesn't have this part, it's not so useful. So let's start with the go refers uh, command. So for that, like, with the, this is the mode. This is the Guru mode we are going to use. And this is the command we are going to use it, go refers. So when we call this on any identifier, it goes and shows me the uh, referred uh, identifiers. Like when I call this on the handler, like my cursor is here, okay? And when I call it, uh, uh, what, man? Okay, I don't know what, what's happening here, okay. So here, um, so it says that it's here, uh, this is the uh, this is the type that we're creating, and then like it is also here reference here. As you see, there is a handler, and also here there is a string uh, method for the handler. And we we can also call this on any other like like on the HTTP request. So because this is a uh, identifier that's used a lot in many many packages, this takes a lot of time. But let's try. Why not? So let's see. Look. When I call go refers here, it says analyzing, and then the Vim UI is blocked. You can't move your cursor, unfortunately, but we're gonna fix it. So, yeah, so there you go. And the UI is not the greatest, I know, but at least here we can jump. Like there is one inclined, right? There is a like as you see here, you know, you can like there is tons of them, you know. And we can just jump all of the refers. Like if you have variable and you, you just want to see what's going on, you can easily go and uh, check it out. So yeah, this is uh, go refers. And let me show another feature. Uh, and this time I'm gonna show the describe mode of Guru. Uh, this is actually just like go info. Like, but go info only shows like small bits, like raw uh, message string, like a variable declaration a function signature. But sometimes you want to understand more, like what type of an expression, like what the size or alignment of a, st uh, uh, of a struct, or like uh, what is the method set of a, uh, like, uh, of a type, right? So like here, uh, we have this request URL part here, this field, right? Like when I call go described, Okay, I mean, I don't know what's happening here. I think I, I have to save it every time, I don't know. So the thing is, is uh, so it says it is defined here, okay? It's defined in the request file. And it has the following methods, escape pad is a, a B, C, the parse. And then uh, it also says, okay, this is a uh, type, and these are the fields, like user, host, and stuff like that. So describe is really useful for things like this. Uh, like when we call it on, yeah, you can call it on everywhere. Like this is the log package when I call it here. Uh, it goes and says, okay, this is the package and these are the functions and these are the constants and these are the methods, right? So this is really great uh, to understand what an identifier is or not. Uh, but this is like, sometimes you want to see locally what's happening. Um, there is a mode called same IDs. It says, uh, it's actually called same identifiers. And it goes and highlights the identifiers that are the same. Like, what does it mean? Like here, the handler, right? When you go and call same IDs here, as you see, like the handlers are all highlighted. And then you can clear it with go clear. Like this doesn't go and like highlight these of kind of things, like, this was, uh, look, only, only the part of what is the same identifier will be highlighted. And uh, like here, when you uh, clear it again, 
We don't clear it because you want to investigate it, but we have another mode that I'm going to show. It's dynamically changing. Like again, when we call it on the, on the error uh, variable here, it goes and shows me the real error. Like if also shows like if there is another if error, it will not uh, highlight them. So this is really useful, but you want it to be sometimes automatically. For that, we have go same auto toggle. Naming is hard. So when you use this, uh, same ID auto highlighting is enabled. We just merged this, I think, yesterday. Uh, it's very new. Uh, like at that, you can like move your cursor, like so, and then like page, like hedge, and then it automatically highlights it. So it's really great. And then when you call it again, you can uh, turn it off. Uh, yeah, this is really great. So let's move to the Guru's implements mode. This is like, this shows like which uh, interfaces are implemented by a given type. Like this handler type here, uh, when I want to know which uh, interfaces it implemented, I just call it go implements. It, and it goes and analyzes it and says, hey, okay, I found it's implement from a stringer. Uh, it implements my interface, okay, and then it also inter implements uh, a HTTP handler interface, and of course this runtime stringer, which I think if you implement from a stringer, it also implements this one. Uh, so it's great, like, but you can also do the reverse of it, and like, so, like when we put the cursor on top of serve HTTP here, right, and call go implements, it will say that this concrete method function uh, implements uh, is uh, this method here. So like if you have a method name and you call go implements, you can find which uh, uh, part, uh, which, uh, which part, which uh, interface part it is. And then finally, again, I mean, it's really useful, like anything about interfaces. Suppose I have the interface already here, Oh uh, wait, uh, sorry. So I have the interface here, my interface, and I want to see which uh, types uh, implements this, right? When I type go implements, it says is implemented by this handler, which is yes here. It has this example method, which, as you see, go implement is really useful uh, to get an idea like, like what type is being implemented. And yeah, I'm gonna come to the end, just a little bit time for a couple of modes. We have this which error mode, and like as you saw, errors are just values, so it, they can be anything, and that's why sometimes you like you uh, want to implement a custom mode, <laughs> like if error is like uh, error not found, like say, like just I mean, like something like that, and then you go and implement your logic. But do you know which like which types it uh, it really uh, this error be, can be? Like you have a, a lot of packages in your GoPad, and you want to know like which uh, like val which types this error can be. And then for this case, we have this command called which uh, go which error, and if you call it, uh, this goes and analyzes. Uh, the scope you define, not the go path, because it's really a very costly method, uh, costly call. That's why it only uh, checks go root and then this package. But you can give package, you can also define, hey, go and check go path. But it really takes a lot of time because it had to go and traverse all the packages. But as you see, this error like can be like syscall uh, and involve or it can be like syscall erno. It can be net op error, like as, it, and this is really great, like maybe you want to like handle the case when it's net op error, like with the type switch. And yeah, this is how, do, how you use which errors. And then well, there is this peers mode, peers. This is just for channels. Uh, to be honest, I don't use it so much, uh, but it is there if you need it. And for that, we have to uh, select 
uh, like a statement, like a receive statement, a send statement. Like if you select it and then call uh, go channel peers and hit enter, it will go and say, okay, this is channel of type. It, it shows the, uh, the type of the channel. It says it is allocated here, yes. The handler uh, identifier is of type chan uh, uh, int. And then it's being sent here. As you see, you sent the n integer to the channel, and but you receive it from here. Like, and here's the place where you receive. But as you see, the, all the names, the identifier names, they are all different, but it's all the same channel. And this is uh, important. Like, if you use a program application that is very heavy concurrent based and you, you use a lot of channels especially and this might be very useful for you to see like how the channels uh, values are being sent and received. So yeah, let's move to 16 and I think th yeah, this is our last file. So this is again, uh, we're gonna show these two modes, callies and callers. In this example, we have this function here, uh, this first class function, we pass it to the hello function. And then I want to know like uh, the callies of this function, like which functions could be these, right? I mean like, it, okay, it's just pen, but what, what do I pass here? And I, I want to know this. And to know this, I call go callies. When I call this, it says I'm analyzing it and I found two pieces, two functions. One is here, which is this digital ocean function, and the one other is the Kenya function. And these are defined in the example uh, package. And like I am importing it here, and as you see, I'm passing them to the hello function here. Both. So just with the go callies, I can easily follow it and see where, uh, like, which functions this function might be calling. And Suppose you have a function declaration, and like suppose you have the hello here, and you want to know uh, the callers of this function declaration, like which package or like which function does call this hello function. And this time I'm just gonna call go callers. Uh, uh, look at this R, the, um, and when you hit enter, it says, okay, I have found two uh, functions. One is this and the other one is the hello. It automatically finds for you, and it's really great. And yeah, this is like how you use Guru. I mean, Guru has a lot of great um, features, and as you see, we spot uh, all of them. We only don't spot points to mode, I think, and I assume because I don't use it, and nobody wants it. <laughs> but I'm open to, you know, pull requests, as always. You can come uh, and open a pull request. So yeah, uh, this is Guru. But before I finish, let me show two more examples and then, yeah, we're finished. So for code generations, uh, like suppose you have this type here, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, you have this type here. And then like you, you want to implement uh, some methods for this type. And it's really annoying like when you write, uh, you have an interface with a lot of methods, like net.con, and you want to write a test for it. Uh, of, I wish you don't, but suppose you, you, you write a test for it. And then like you can write go impl, and your cursor is on top of the T, but it might, it shouldn't, I mean, it can be also somewhere else. And then you just write the interface. Like in this case, I just write the, I will write closer. When I hit enter, it goes and creates the, methods this impl uh, interface uh, has. Like I, I've just deleted it, and the great thing is like it has auto-completion. When I hit IO dot, and I, I, I just tap, it goes and auto-completes it for me. And it can like, it can uh, generate any uh, interface. Like this time netcon, as you see. And, and the great thing is it compiles, oh no, it's not, it doesn't compile. It should, uh, like when we have this T, yeah, I mean, it's great. Like when you write tests, you should use it. It's really great. So let's jump to my last example. Uh, delete this, uh, wait. Okay, I know. Okay. 
okay, delete this, delete this, and this, I mean, we have this. Uh, and like, this is an awesome feature. Uh, this is show something. Uh, if you want to show this to your coworker, to your friend, and of course we have Go Play. Uh, we have this pl playground. Like, uh, oh wait, I think just because of this, yeah, like this, right? And I'm like, make this like this, and we have a command called Go Play, and it goes and uploads the snippet to the playground automatically for you, and then it's. You can easily like copy the link, but you don't have to, because we already copied it to for you, to your clipboard. <laughs> uh, so this is also something that a lot of people don't know. So this is a really great feature, and you can disable it. There is a setting for it, if you don't like it. Uh, yeah, and then you can also select. Like I'm just selecting it in the main function and hit go play. Uh, in this case, it just uh, uploads that uh, part. Uh, part, portion of the source code. So yeah, uh, this is my little uh, demo about Bimgo. Thanks for this solution, hosting this great meetup. Thanks for all of you coming, and thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>